Your monitor is probably lying to you. Display manufacturers have a lot of creative ways of describing their products. Backed by pure, unadulterated power. But don't worry, we are here to help you figure out what is real and what is hype. Welcome to Upscale, the garage edition. This is our explainer show where we break down the bits of tech that make your gadgets work. Now, we spent the last few episodes talking about 5G, and we know you folks still have a few questions there, and we may return to it. But for now, we wanted to take a break and talk about monitors, and specifically the specs where manufacturers aren't always entirely truthful. To now, there are three main areas where specs can be a little bit deceiving, and they have to do with response time overdrive, chroma subsampling, and color depth. First off, a quick refresher on LCD technology. In all LCDs, a backlight, these days usually a bunch of LEDs, shines through a layer of liquid crystal and then through a red, green, or blue color filter. Now, this liquid crystal is made up of materials that change shape when voltage is applied to them. You can think of them kind of like tiny doors behind each pixel. Apply some voltage and the door opens and lets light through. It's also worth noting there are three main types of LCDs. TN, IPS, and VA. TN is the oldest technology, it's been around the longest, but these days most panels you see, most computer monitors, almost every laptop screen, the majority of TVs, and most older or cheaper phones are all IPS. IPS has a really wide viewing angle and great color, which are things TN is not as good at. VA panels are out there too, but they're a little more specialized. They have really good color depth, but they have pretty slow response times, which means they're not ideal for movies or games. Fast motion can sometimes blur, which is something TN panels are still great at. If you play games at all, response time is probably the spec you are most familiar with. This is how quickly an individual pixel can change its shade or color, and a slow response time can lead to excessive motion blur or even ghosting, where a moving image actually leaves a trail on screen. Now, response time is different from refresh rate, which is the number of new images the monitor can draw per second. Both are important, but we'll touch more on refresh rate in a second. Companies used to measure response time by how long it took a pixel to go from black to white, back to black again. The pixel's shade is actually controlled by how much voltage is applied to it, and that black to white transition was used because it's the highest voltage the pixel can take, and thus it was the fastest transition. To use our door analogy again, the voltage is kind of like how hard you're pushing on a door to get it to open. To go from black to maybe just dark gray, you're just kind of nudging the door, but to go from black all the way to white, you are throwing the door wide open as fast as you can. The absolute fastest response time you can get in a TN panel is about three milliseconds these days, though the fastest IPS panels are a lot slower at 12 to 17 milliseconds. But wait, you might be saying, if I go online right now, I can find hundreds of IPS monitors all advertising response times under a millisecond. Are they lying? Maybe a little? The full black to white transition is actually relatively uncommon in an image. How often is part of your screen changing from totally black to totally white? Much more common is transitions between two different shades of gray. And the problem is this is a much slower transition. Because the voltage applied to a pixel not only determines what shade it ends up at, but also how hard it's pushed to get there, so-called gray to gray transitions could be very slow. Shifting between two different shades of dark gray could actually take 30 milliseconds or more, which is slow enough that our eyes can notice the smear. The solution to this was overdrive, or so-called response time compensation. This hits the pixel with the full voltage it can take, but only for a split second. Back in our door analogy, it's kind of like throwing open a door so hard that it bounces off the wall and back nearly closed again. It makes those gray to gray transitions way faster, and it really does cut down on motion blur and ghosting. And most companies have started using this, and they've also started advertising their gray to gray transition speeds, which are now much faster than that black to white to black. What are you talking about? Doors and should we, do, we should do that take again? The problem here is that black to white to black was actually an official metric set by the International Standards Organization. It was consistent and comparable between companies. It always meant the same thing. The gray to gray standard varies widely based on the panel type, the shades of gray being transitioned between even the manufacturer of the panel. And you can bet that whatever number you are seeing advertised is the absolute best case scenario for that panel. And it may not perform that well most of the time. 
time. There are a few potential downsides to overdrive too. If the pixel really overshoots its target with that high voltage, you can actually end up with a bright halo around moving objects, and overdrive can make image noise, especially in dark parts of the image, a lot worse. Also, it's just not comparable. It's hard to know if one millisecond from one company is the same as a millisecond response time from another. On the plus side, as long as the monitor looks good to you, that's really all that matters here. Whoa, color. And that's also true for color depth, mostly. Color depth is how many different hues of color a monitor can display. Now, we've touched on this a bit in earlier episodes, but it's usually expressed as bit depth, either six or eight or 10 bit color. TN panels are the worst here. They originally only had six bit color, which is actually only 64 different hues. Now, remember this is for each primary color. So actually it's 64 green, 64 red, and 64 blue. And you can multiply those together and you actually get 252,144 possible colors, but that's actually not a ton. Fortunately, monitor makers had a trick to work around this and it's called dithering. Dithering is a technique for actually approximating a higher bit depth by adding some noise to an image. And one place this is used a lot actually is in gradients. In a low bit depth image, gradients can have noticeable banding, but by adding some random noise, you can actually help break up those bands and approximate a higher bit depth image. Now, the technique used in monitors is a little bit different. The most common is called frame rate control, and what it does is actually flip a pixel back and forth between two colors so fast that it looks to our eyes like a third color the monitor isn't actually capable of displaying. The same way that enough still images moving fast enough looks like a moving picture to us, switch back and forth from red to blue fast enough, and it looks to our eyes like purple. Older TN panels had six plus two color depth, which means they used a six bit panel plus frame rate control to approximate eight bit color. These days, most TN panels actually are eight bit, but as we're starting to see 10 bit IPS panels become way more popular, a lot of those are actually eight plus two and not true 10 bit, including some pretty high end monitors like the screen of the iMac Pro. There are true 10-bit IPS screens out there, but they are relatively rare and pretty expensive. So does this matter to you? Well, again, if it looks good enough, maybe not. Oh yeah, perfect. FRC actually does a pretty good job approximating a higher bit depth, and as long as the screen looks good to you, that might be enough. Some folks are especially sensitive to the slight flicker it can introduce, though. It sometimes makes colors look like they're shimmering, especially in the darker parts of an image. And if you work with digital photos or media, well then, maybe having true 10-bit color actually does matter to you. What a higher bit depth really does is let your monitor display colors more accurately. And while you can't account for how an image is going to look on every one screen out in the world, the same way you're better off editing an original photo than a low quality JPEG off the web, you're better off doing your work on a high quality accurate screen before you send out your image or video to the rest of the world. Now this leads into chroma subsampling, which is another way monitors can distort color. And this one has to do especially with high refresh rate monitors. Now remember we said the refresh rate is the number of new frames the monitor can draw on screen per second. And for a long time, 60 hertz or 60 frames per second has been the standard. But considering a high-end gaming PC or even a mid-range one can probably put out over 100 frames per second in some games, that monitor refresh rate has been a big limiting factor in getting the smoothest, most responsive gameplay possible up on screen. But there is hope. The last few years have seen an influx of 144 hertz or even 240 hertz monitors that can display ultra fast frame rates. These screens tended to work okay at HD 1080p resolution, but as 4K 144 hertz and up screens started to come onto the market, some folks noticed that outside of games, a lot of these screens looked, well, kind of lousy. The issue here actually lies with the connector between the computer and the monitor. Most folks trying to get this really high frame rate gameplay are using DisplayPort, and the current DisplayPort 1.4 standard actually only has the bandwidth for 120 frames per second at 4K resolution. 
you're trying to send a 10-bit signal, it's actually even lower, around 100 frames per second. The cables and ports just can't transmit enough data to keep up with 4K at 144 Hz, so chroma subsampling is used. Now, what this does is it splits your image into two parts. One, the luma, just encodes the brightness of each pixel, and the other part encodes the color, or the chroma. There's actually three parts, but it really doesn't matter here. What subsampling then does is it throws out half of the color pixels, compressing that image by half in one direction. So your image gets turned into two halves. One, encoding brightness, is full resolution, 3840 by 2160 pixels in 4K, but the other, the color, is only 1920 by 2160 resolution. Essentially, half of your color information is just gone. So your 4K image at 144 hertz isn't really 4K. But here's the thing, our eyes are way more sensitive to brightness, to that Luma component, than they are to color. The method used here is called 422 subsampling, but JPEGs and pretty much all video on the web and Blu-rays actually use 420 subsampling, which throws out half the color information in each direction. It only leaves a quarter of it behind. And Blu-rays still look pretty good. And actually, gameplay at 422 looks fine too. The only place you really get issues with chroma subsampling is very fine, high contrast details on a static background. Like say, oh, text on a screen, or pretty much any interface element of your standard computer desktop. In these situations, fine details, and especially thin vertical lines, can end up looking smudged or blurred, or even partially absent. Now, most modern high refresh rate monitors do have an option for a non-gaming mode that will restore full color, but if you don't know what's causing your desktop to look lousy in the first place, you might not know that's a setting you need to change. The crazy thing here is that DisplayPort can support 4K at 120 Hz with no problems and no subsampling, and I, for the life of me, cannot work out why manufacturers made 144 Hz the standard. The difference between 120 and 144 frames per second is pretty negligible, with the big difference being just that at 4K, 144 hertz is going to make your desktop look like garbage. All of these problems will get better with future technology. OLED panels already have nearly instantaneous response times, but they're still pretty expensive, not terribly bright, and they're not great for computers where static images on the desktop can burn in over time or leave a trace image behind on the screen. Micro LED is a new technology we're expecting any day now that should solve those drawbacks, but we're not sure when it's going to arrive, and again, it'll probably be pretty expensive when it first does. Future HDMI and DisplayPort standards should get rid of the subsampling problem too. HDMI 2.1 can support 4K at 144Hz no problem, and can actually support up to 10K at 120Hz using something called display stream compression, which is different from subsampling. It doesn't actually throw out any of the information, but it'll be a while before those new standards are really fully supported. We're starting to see a few HDMI 2.1 TVs come on the market, but there aren't really any monitors that support that standard yet, and also no graphics cards, so it's kind of a moot point. DisplayPort 2.0 should support similar speeds as well, but we're not expecting to see any devices support that until the end of 2020. So for now, maybe 4K at 120 hertz is enough? Let us know if there are any other tech questions you want explained. We are stuck inside with a lot of free time right now, so if there's anything you've been dying to get explained to you, let us know, and we'll try to figure it out. And in the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe, and wash your darn hands. We'll see you next time.